people here have seen auroras? Quite a few. So you've been like, super lucky because it's uh, generally I find that there's not a lot of people who've seen them. And I don't I don't know if your experience is the same as mine. And I will talk about what you see when you don't um, when you go out because when I first did it, I actually went with my mother the first time. My mom's here in front row. She's visiting for Mother's Day, and um, we went to Iceland. Uh, for the sole purpose of going out and finding the aurora. So we went to the dead of winter. And you start asking people, am I going to see this? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's easy. You know, it's always out. And you're like, okay. But nobody tells you really what to look for. And what your expectation is is this green light or some version of this. And it probably was a couple days in before we realized we had been seeing it, but it wasn't, it wasn't green. It resolves green in the camera um, and other colors in your camera. And I'll talk about why I think that is in a little it. We'll talk about you know what the lights are, kind of how they're created. And it's also kind of interesting to understand the different the, the different aspects and different wildlife behaviors and things that happen. So we can cover a little bit of that. Um, and we'll talk about the overview of the process for, of the displays and how they're created. We're going to talk about when and where you can see it. So basically the northern latitudes, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, the southern latitudes. Um, in the colder months, you need a dark sky. So that's not to say that this isn't going on all the time. It is, you just don't have the benefit of seeing it in the middle of summer. This was actually taken at the top of China Hot Springs outside of Fairbanks. It's about an hour and a half outside of Fairbanks. And the mountaintop is completely uh, being lit by almost a full moon. So it, it's interesting because some of the photos you're gonna see here, the foreground is gonna be very dark. And that's taken on a no moon. And um, I've come to actually like about a half moon. I, I like that light because I can get real foreground and real detail without having to make the image noisy to do it. Um, and I don't have to have the ISO up as much. And there's a whole bunch of things that happen um, quite nicely when you have a full moon. So although I know a lot of what you guys do, you look for no moons. A lot of what I do for my star photography is no moons. I found that uh, the moon adds quite a bit of um, attraction particular image, um, this piece of it here, if you can see the red dot, is is probably a, a pew screen. It's really a green color to your eye, especially once you've been outside in the dark long enough. As you know, your eyes adjust, you get to see more. Um, and then this up here is probably just a white cloud uh, and some variation in the middle. So it just really depends. And that's the point. When you go to stand outside and see this, it could be really happening right above your head and you might not know it. You might just think that's a cloud. And, it, and it's not until you really pay attention to the fact that that cloud is moving and wiggling and changing shape that you realize that you're looking at your cross. So, um, again, this is Chena, so that just so you know where you are. This is Chena. This is going to be really bright, almost a little light green in the sky here in this area. Um, taking on the same night as the other one. So the Aurora Borealis uh, was named by Galileo. Aurora was the Roman goddess of dawn, and Borealis was the Greek name for the north wind. So that's the genesis, my understanding of the genesis of the name. So uh, essentially what happens is that the sun ejects solar gas and cloud, uh, clouds of dust. And so you sort of see the motion here. I know you guys know about this because you're looking through your telescopes and whatnot. But it's going to kick this uh, gas off. So that mass quite huge and, and historically has done damage. We have never really been hit uh, since the 1800s with one that was so big. And these days it would have a huge impact on us because it would knock out our electric grids and um, phones and all the systems that we use. But we're protected by that from our, by our atmosphere. Two trillion tons is, I mean, there's no real way to wrap your brain around what that looks like. And in sort of looking this up, Googling it, um, the closest that I could get to an understanding was when the ice shelf collapsed a few years back, I mean, maybe it's a decade now, um, this huge piece of the ice shelf in the Arctic felt, you know, came loose and landed in the water. That shelf was uh, estimated to be about one trillion. So that's huge. It was a huge dramatic event, and that's like twice that coming at us through space. What ends up happening is that those, uh, the, so the, Solar gas comes off and comes into the atmosphere and it starts to interact with our atmosphere. The particles are coming in on this side and then it comes in and it bends around and then it snaps back. And as it's bending our atmosphere and it gets kind of on the other side of the planet, when it comes together, part of it is sucked back towards the planet. And that's what's throwing the uh, kind of 
kind of the gases to the poles, and that's why these things in the, the you see the auroras on the poles. The particles are colliding with oxygen and nitrogen, and that's actually what's creating the color. The auroras are not unique to our planet. They happen in Jupiter. So here's an example of that taken from the Hubble space. They happen in on Saturn, so this is a rendition also from the telescope. That'd be really kind of cool to see. I'd like to, I'd like to see uh, Saturn up close and personal, actually. Um, I think it'd be neat. Uh, so anyway, so what ends up happening is that the particles uh, kind of interact with our atmosphere, and depending on what's being charged, um, either ionized or excited, gives you the color, and it really will range the entire spectrum, uh, depending on the activity. So oxygen and nitrogen are your two main particles in the color spectrum, so whether they're excited, excited or ionized. You will see purple, and you will see red, and you will see pink, just depending on how these things are interacting together. Green is the most common color. And it's, it has to do with the number of collisions and, um, and the <clears throat> that happen in the frequency of getting the displays and how much brightness that you're going to get. 60, 70 degrees uh, in the latitudes is where you are. You'll see that um, this is Iceland. This is the tip of Greenland. Um, and it kind of moves around. And it, but it doesn't stay at the top. It, it, during the whole nights, the trajectory of the night, that oval sort of moves and comes around and then goes back out. So it does change. But this is a general idea. And this is what would be considered a fairly normal uh, banding. So a normal banding here might take you through this area. So here's Fairbanks. Bettles is where I go to shoot. Um, generally, that's where I am. You'll see that it'll come down into Talkeetna. And then these are, this is a, if it's really active, you'll get to these outside wider bands. So you're not going to get as much activity. So. When we go to do this on a tour, we are we go and stay in battles, which is almost always right in the center of the sun when it's passing through. Both in the north and in the south of Iceland. Um, honestly, like if you're going to go, Iceland is a beautiful place to go at any time. It's an incredible country. But their winters are more fraught with weather than Alaska. So when you get up above the Arctic Circle, um, Bettles is really dry and it's really pretty landlocked and so at the end of the day on a cold night you don't get a lot of water vapor and anything else in the atmosphere to sort of get in your way. In fact, a 20 degrees, a zero degrees, that's almost too warm. You really want to be well into the negatives because that, that's considered warm there and you will get fog. Um, because Iceland is an island, it gets weather and it is changeable weather, but it's a lot of weather and you, you spend a lot of time trying to run around and get out of the cloud cover uh, to catch it. Um, you can see that it's passing though through the top here, it's the Norway, Finland, Sweden area, and then parts of Russia way over at the top of that too. This is an Icelandic aurora. Um, so we are, if, I'll go back really quick. This is the West Fjords. This doesn't have the shape, but basically the top of Iceland is like this. They're all these fjords. And um, so that's across here. We were standing up here, and we were probably 30 miles from the Arctic Circle at the highest point where we were in Iceland, when my mother and I saw that. In Alaska, we're 36 miles north of the Arctic Circle, so we're getting further than and so that's what it looked like. We were on one fjord shooting across the water to the other fjord. Um, and it was coming up out of this little island right here that looked like it was spinning it out. On this side, we had this shape. If you looked over to our left hand shoulder, though, we had a whole wall of like red. So this the coloring that you see here was just a sheet. There was no real definition in the world. When you go out to see it, you end up with um, what looks like a white contrail. Right? Especially early. And it could be really active. Sometimes it's active at 9 o'clock, sometimes it's active at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's just really random and there's no real predictor of it. Um, you've got to have to pray to the sun gods basically to, to give you a good activity two or three days before to get a really great activity a couple months later. Um, but what you end up seeing is like a, it would look like a contrail maybe. It would look like almost just wispy high cloud. And so for me, and, and what happened with us, is that we'd see it and it just looks like high, thin cloud. And if you're not taking the time to stop and really look, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it at all. Now, finally, after a couple of days,
space and having Icelanders tell me, well, yeah, it's easy to see, and we had clear night, so it didn't make any sense that we hadn't seen it at all. I finally stopped the car in the middle of nowhere and took a photo, and it was green. So I was like, oh, I'm sure we've been missing it for days. But, but nobody tells you it's going to look white, so you're not thinking, you're like, where's that? Where's this color that I want to see? And unfortunately, that's not what you're going to see when you stop. Um, so here's my theory on why, right? Rods and cones. So you need, your cones are what going to capture light, and you need light to be able to do that. And the dimmer the light, the harder it is to discern color. Your rods work at night, that's what gives you your contrast. So that's your black and white vision, what you get from black and white vision. And at night, because you're not getting enough light activity, you'd be hard pressed to tell if I was wearing gray or black or blue in a night sky, uh, or in a night foreground or whatever. You'd be hard to tell that. So when the aurora first starts, if it's not super active, you're not getting really enough light to trigger your cones into action to see what colors are coming out. Now when it's super active and you get these really hot spots like this, that's giving off enough light that your eyes are collecting the information and, and returning color to you. Um, the reason I think the camera is different is one, your, your eyes are seeing instantaneously, right? So you're seeing just a, a moment of time fast moment of time, where your camera might be taking two or three seconds, four seconds of, of accumulating light into the sensor, and so it's being able to resolve the color that you're not picking up. So I do think that that's the reason. Um, when it gets really active, like there was a squiggly one that I had in the beginning, when it's really active like that, and your eyes are starting to adjust, and you've been outside for a couple of hours, you will see more and more activity, and you'll be able to discern, you'll be able to look at it and go, that has red in it. And then you'll take a picture of it and you'll see red. So I think that that's a big part of it. Um, but it is deceiving. And I've had a lot of people say, well, I went to see it, but I didn't see anything. And it's like, uh, I think you probably did. And you didn't realize you were seeing it because everybody sees these shots and they're all green and pretty. And they expect to walk out or step out of the restaurant or get out of the car and see a big splash of green. And it just doesn't happen. That way. So if you, if you are going and you're not going with someone who can point it out to you, Right, and say, okay, that's it, keep an eye on it, then know to look for something that just doesn't look normal. And for us, the cloud that was white started to shift and change. And so you'll get what looks like a contrail, but suddenly it's a snake, right? And then it's like a heartbeat. And you're like, okay, that's not a cloud, that's not a cloud. The clouds just don't do that. So then you start to realize you've probably seen it. Um, so types of displays, um, so there's arcing displays, and these are, some of these are kind of just known around, uh, as in, you know, the terms are sort of known, I don't think that there's a rule, but you'll get these arcing displays that really just kind of cut, you know, cut a huge arch through the sky. Um, but as you saw in my video, they come and they change and they, they manipulate, they don't stay any one thing for very long. Tons of just activity, and they don't, it's not all of one. That's what I'm saying. It changes and it will do different things. And it can last for two or three minutes. It can last for two or three hours. They come and go. This thing can completely shut off like a light switch and hours later come back out. Um, it, is, it is very imprecise. <clears throat> when you look at the Aurora apps, and even that, when you're in Iceland and when you're everywhere and you're asking people about what's the status and what's the likelihood and is it going to happen, you know, they'll come and tell you, well, the app says it's a two, so it goes one to nine. And they'll kind of say, well, like, it's a two, you know, you should probably see it. And, you know, so in your head you're thinking, okay, well, when's it going to be, on my trip, am I going to see a four, five, six, seven? And they're very rare. And this is a set, like a five, five or six. So it's interesting because there's this big push to say, well, two isn't worthwhile. But this is like a two. So, um, and I never gave that a bunch of thought. You know, I never thought about why that, that was the case. I mean, I look at this and I'm, I'm as dumbfounded by this moment. In fact, fact, maybe more so because it's nice and defined and I can take a really good shot of it and you get the C shape. Um, so in talking to a gentleman last time I was in Iceland and we were talking about the it, it coming out, and he said, yeah, I think it's a two to nine or something like that. I go, well, it's really beautiful out over the lagoon. And he was back at the hotel. I had to go pick somebody up. And he's like, yeah, my favorite times are when it's a two or a three. And I know people who have said, well, I'm not, don't wake me if it's a two, right? Leave me sleep. I only want to come out if it's 
that's really active. And it was interesting because this is something he chases around all the time, and, and his attitude was, a two may not last six hours, but when it comes out, it's going to be dramatic and beautiful for that short window of time that it's active. So when you roll forward to something like a seven, as interesting as this moment was, it's everywhere. It's still defined. It's, it doesn't have the same, to me, it doesn't think. It is, it is. It doesn't have the same impact. It doesn't. You know, it's it's impactful of its own. You're like, well, this is like the entire sky is, is like this and moving. But it isn't as artistic. It isn't as interesting in its shape and form. Um, and, but it's everywhere. So this would be like a seven. So it, it, seven is really dramatic, but it isn't necessarily uh, as grand in some ways, in my opinion. So this is Iceland. Um, we did not, we, we, the aurora came out really early on this day, like 9.30, it came out really early, as soon as the sun went down, we saw some, did some shooting, and then it disappeared. And I got up, this might have been 3 o'clock in the morning, which is really late. You know, I find traditionally I can get good aurora between, say, 10 and 1, 1.30 in the morning. I woke up to go to the bathroom, and I was like, I wonder what's going on. So I opened up through my window, which is already open, I still the, the hotels are way too hot for me, so I stayed through the windows open. The, um, so I opened up the door, and I kind of craned my head out, and I saw this, really this fat, wide band. Of, it, it had never seen anything like it. It was just this weird, big band, almost like a road going through the sky. And I nudge my better half, and I'm like, I'm not getting up. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm good. I'm staying here. I'm warm. I'm not getting dressed. I'm like, should I go outside? And so, at o'clock in the morning, I pulled all my clothes on over my PJs, took my camera, one camera, one body, one body, one lens, one tripod, got out to the parking lot, and this was on the other side. So the band was sort of over there, and, and within a 15 or 20 minute span of time, it had sort of let go of its shape and moved across the whole sky and did that. I was out there for like 30 minutes, and it was gone again. It's crazy. It was really amazing. So I've never seen anything quite that big, but um, it, that would be what they would call a five, six, or seven, and it's just huge, and it just takes over everything. Um, uh, this is also Iceland, and this is again over the lagoon. So you've got the glacier here in the background, the icebergs that are broken off, waiting to make their way out to the Atlantic Ocean, and um, the, I got lucky. I've been waiting for this moment. Um, the one thing I haven't been able to get in Iceland yet is actually over, if you've seen these um, beautiful, they're called, it's called Diamond Beach. That's the nickname, but it's the beach that these uh, birds make their way out and hit the Atlantic, churn back up and get thrown back and stuck on the sand. So it's a black sand beach and usually some really beautiful polished ice. I've yet to get a decent aurora actually out over the ice. This might have been the day, not necessarily though, just depending on, there could have been no ice that day. So the ice isn't 100% guaranteed. Um, but anyway, so it's a beautiful location. It kind of felt dragging to me when I was standing there. So some of the concerns about shooting this. So this is really, I think, the challenge um, in general when you're out shooting. Uh, it's cold, really cold, super, super cold. So if you think it's cold here at 32 degrees on a bad day, the best ones I've seen are negative 38. And there's just no way to relate what negative 38 feels like when you go outside. Um, so that's one thing to think about. The best ones uh, happen at the very pol lowest, coldest temperatures. And um, most of us don't own the gear for that. I, I don't mean like necessarily the camera gear, I'll talk about that in a second, but we don't own the like clothing gear. And so, so I pointed out the yurts, right? I, I, I told you about the Aurora Lodge, I showed you the yurt for Sven, and then at the top of Chena Hot Springs, those photos had a yurt in it. When you go to do this, it's important to know where you're going. And if you're going on your own, it's not that you can't find those places and get there, but if you're going with somebody, like you go with us or another group, then you know somebody's going to be kind of protecting you. If you just get out and go to Fairbanks and jump in the car and head out the Seas Highway, you, know, you might be out at negative 38 degrees, um, which can get dangerous quickly if you're ill-prepared, and not have a way to get warm. 
uh, other than the car, which if it's been turned off a while, it's going to take you some time. Um, so it's good to know where you're going and make sure that the place that you're going to can help you uh, protect yourself. Um, the yurts are really great. Uh, they are a way, but the problem with the yurts is that they're extremely warm inside, and going in and out creates sweat. But if you take your gear in and out, you've created damage. So you're tend to, you know, you have to leave your gear outside while you go in to like warm up. Um, there isn't anybody, unless you're an extreme explorer. We none of us own the clothing for this, right? It, you're talking about extraordinarily heavy clothing. Um, not even the stuff that you see on, on the guys riding on the um, sleds and the Iditarod. It's still not even meant for this. They have multiple layers. So part, partly is going to a place that might be able to help you accommodate those needs instead of trying to buy it all for yourself. Because this, if this isn't going to be your hobby, then you don't want to have to invest in the you know, $700 uh, thick Eskimo coat that you would need. Um, where we go in Vettel's, they actually have clothing available. So you come up there in your ski, ski pants and your ski parka and your negative 25 boots. And first day out, you realize, I need a different coat, I need different overlay of pants, and I need negative 60 boots. So, um, and the neat thing is, is they have a whole array of, of clothes and sizes for people. So it's important just to think about that. If you're going to go make a plan for yourself, do some research around if you're going someplace that can accommodate the need that you might have. Um, because I think that's the biggest challenge. So unless you're prepared properly, um, it can be potentially fatal, not just uh, harmful to you. Frostbite's obviously a given. You're touching metal cameras, metal tripods. Your hands get quick, cold very fast. Um, if you take your gloves off to manipulate your camera gear, um, so that's something to think about. Definitely dressing in layers, uh, mittens, hats, hoods, balaclava, uh, sock, you know, wool socks. I actually wear a, um, a uh, battery-operated vest that gets hot. So that's the bomb. So I wear, I might wear a lighter uh, layer, like a thin turtleneck, like a, a silk or something, and under, like almost like under, um, under clothes. On that, though, I have a heated vest underneath all my overlay stuff. So I, that way, I keep my cool going. Um, ice cleats, especially if you're not in a place that's super dry. So um, up in the above the Arctic Circle, you don't get a lot of water. So you, it's it, the snow is pretty easy to walk in, especially it's not well traveled up there, so it's not packed. But if you're going to be other places, um, you know, make sure you have some ice cleats because the last thing you want to do is take a header. While you're out there, I will tell you I now have like six different uh, kinds of boots. Started off with negative 25, went to negative 40, a couple of pairs of those because they just weren't finding that they were doing what I wanted. And this last trip, I had I bought a pair of negative 60. Now I've done that because I go almost every year, um, and for me it just made sense to try to find the boots that I wanted. The uh, for, for everybody else it doesn't make sense to go to that expense, and so. Bettles actually like has boots of all kinds of varying sizes of those too. They're called bunny boots. They're not super attractive, you know, you're not gonna steal them and take them home, but they will keep your feet warm. And what they end up doing is getting a lot more distance from the snow to you. And um, layers of socks or putting on newspaper in those with uh, underneath, uh, inside, like either under the sole that it has, um, so that you, again, putting distance between you and the snow. But nothing's going to keep you warm standing, standing still taking a picture and or watching. You know, you, you have to move around to stay warm in this environment. Um, if you're going to, um, if you're going to do this and you're going to be someplace remote, you know, make sure that people know where you're going. Uh, either tell the hotel you're staying at, you're heading out, you know, what you're doing in the direction you're going to go. That way, if you don't come back, say something does happen. Um, that somebody will know to look for you at some point. And super remote, you can do uh, cell phone. Because in a place like uh, Bettles, again, there is no communication. So I assume you have a little bit of chance of getting cellular out at the, um, at the lagoon. Or up in the north, you're never very far from a, a, some small town. But Bettles, they have nothing. The only phones up to that work is uh, a cell phone. So 
you have to make sure that at the lodge knows where you've gone or they've dropped you off where they're putting you because there's a couple of different, they have a warning cut out by the lake and then you have to watch it and always go back in if you stay by the lodge. Um, but if you were to really go off on a hike to go get something different, which is okay, you just need to let people know. From a free standpoint, uh, these are the, generally the exposures you're going to want. Obviously, the more moonlight you're going to have, the shorter those exposures can be. Um, I'd say start around 1500 ISO just because you're trying to keep your noise down. Um, you want it to be fast glass, so 1.4 is obviously super fast. Um, 3.5 is about as far as you're going to go. If you get too much over that, you're going to end up with much longer exposure. So a couple of things that happen when, when you get there is you, these things are moving, they're active. So imagine kids running on a field. That's how this is in terms of photography. So if you have a 5.6 and you're shooting at night, if you're not up at 6,000 ISO, depending on your camera, that, that might resolve just fine, you're going to end up with more blur. So it's not that you're not going to get a picture of your blur, you're just going to get a less distinct picture of your blur. Um, so what you really want to try to do is keep it from a second or two, which requires you to have a, a wider aperture. So 1.4, 1.8, 2.8 2, is really where to be. Um, in terms of camera gear and extremes, so I shoot mirrorless. Um, I shoot Fuji. Um, a friend of mine shoots Nikon. Now, because I'm mirrorless, I've taken out a whole aspect of the mechanics of my camera that can cause me a problem. So I have found that my Fuji at negative 38 did just fine. Where my challenge really laid was in the battery life. Um, at negative 38, which is the coldest that I've done, a battery might like last five to 10 minutes and then show dead. I would go, go back to the car, stick it, stick it on the charger, and it would show 100%. I would put a different one in, I'd get five or 10 minutes, and it would go dead. But literally the camera would turn off, the same thing, shows 100%. So, um, you, everybody's going to struggle with battery life. Now, if you have a mirrored camera, like a Nikon or a Canon, the typical bodies, they're now starting to come out with mirrorless, but if you have an older body, um, even new older bodies, um, you have another aspect, which is the mirror, and when you start to get into this kind of temperatures, you'll get the mirror will freeze, uh, it'll get stuck, you'll start to hear, uh, Jim's had a term, I haven't had any problem with my lenses, but he's had her sort of glitchy, grindy, you know, camera shot on its own without him touching it, kind of weirdness in the electronics. So, somewhere between zero degrees and say negative 20, 25, most of these cameras do pretty well. If you actually check them out, they're going to tell you they go to negative 10. So the manufacturer is not going to back you up on that. But we've never had any trouble, and none of our people have had trouble. Um, but when you really get into the extremes, you'll start to see some issues that can make this even more challenging. Um, they do make warmers, so they make these wraps. They're barrel wraps. You can put them on the lens. But in, for me, and, and that's usually done to keep um, humidity and steam off the lens. I actually bought it for myself uh, so I can wrap it around the base of the camera where it attaches to the tripod, which is where my batteries sit, to try to keep that warm. And um, we call them bricks, but basically Anchor has you know, a big fat battery that you can charge. I hung that off the tripod, hooked that up. That's how I plugged in the, the rack and to use that to try to keep things a little bit warmer. So there's some things you can do um, to try to benefit yourself there. You'll obviously want a remote trigger. Um, you don't want to add camera shape to your camera by pressing on the shutter. Uh, so I use one that is uh, wired. I don't like wireless remotes. I find them too inconsistent. I don't want to. Being a nice guy where this is active for a while, this might not be as much of an issue, but I don't like hitting something that I think the shutter's going to go, and that connection doesn't happen, and the shutter doesn't trigger. I just, that's frustrating. So I use wired, uh, wired remotes, but it gets my hand off. And mine is built in, my camera has a built in intervalometer and my remote is an intervalometer, so I can choose either one to get the shutter going. And I will often have two bodies and potentially two tripods, it just depends. Um, but I always have a second body because I don't want to get up here, have something happen and damage the first body, and then not have an opportunity to shoot, so I do carry two. If I have two tripods, I'll just face them in different directions and let them both do their thing. The hardest thing from a photography standpoint is to get my face anywhere near that. So if you can shoot through your LCD, that's a, that's a good solution because you get your nose up against that. 
your camera. It feels like you've been burned. You're, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, so it's it's very unpleasant um, when you've been out there. Like that. that was what I was going to say. So go back to the year. It's one of the things. So that goes to this. So this is that same year. This is Sun's year. Um, these are the guys coming in off of a night uh, dog sledding trip. Uh, where they were out, uh, not our group, which was just another group of people that Sven had up in the property. But they had taken the dog sleds out to go watch the Aurora, and I happened to catch him coming in uh, with Sven and his headlamp. Um, so it's really important to think about where you're going to go to see this. Um, it's nice to have a place to go to get warm, but there's a challenge. And it, it really is the challenge of going inside the gear. Now, this year it's probably around 56 degrees, which seems like it's ridiculously cold, but when it's negative 30 out, 56 feels really good. So, um, but you don't want to take your gear in and out. So it's one thing that you might be able to just take off your coat, not get sweaty. That's your best advice. Once you get in there, kind of peel off the layer so that your body stays dry. The minute you bring your camera in, it will start to steam. The minute you, and that will expand and contract. Once you take that outside, and it turns to ice. So now you've really caused yourself some harm. Now. At one of the times when we were up at the Tabachina Hot Springs, there were people, it's a very popular place, and it's much more the conveyor belt system of um, Aurora, Aurora viewing. This particular place outside of Fairbanks is not, if you get out to this year, you're the only people out there. Um, and Bettles is not, because it's so remote that you, there aren't a lot of people. The Chena Hot Springs, um, they run four, of these like pods up there, and each one has like 12 people, and then they have this, you know, one or two years depending on the day. So you have a lot of people. It's not that you can't get away from them. You didn't see maybe one person in one of my shots there. It's not that you can't get a foreground without people, but there are a lot of people in the yurt, so it's ridiculously hot. And what happens is people in the yurt, the, uh, Chena, I have found, are not true and dedicated to the cause, right? The people who are going there, it's like the Disneyland of the Aurora viewing. And so they go, they wait for to see people scramble out, and if people don't come back, then the whole yurt clears out. And everybody will go see it 10, 15 minutes, and then they all go back to the yurt. And when you go to Jada Hot Springs, you commit to four hours at the top of the mountain. So you either go up at nine and come back at one, or you go up at 10 and come back at two. But you don't get to mix and match. You don't get to go at 10 and come home with people out at nine. They're very particular, and um, that's the only, way, how they, the only way they can keep track if they haven't left somebody at the top of the mountain at the end of the night. So that you have to go with the people who came home. Um, and you're up there for four hours. So if, if you're like us, we're out there until toes are falling off. Like we are dedicated, we are waiting, we're checking. If there's nothing going on for hours, we might go in and get some tea. But if it's going, we're out there until we cannot bear it any longer. Um, but other people you find, they're not like that. They come out, they see it, they take a couple snaps, they run back in. Recognize that you need a place to get warm, but your gear does not. You know, keep your extra batteries uh, inside your coat, inside your vest, inside your pocket somewhere, so that they stay reasonably warm. That'll give them life when you rotate them out. But honestly, you're at the top of the mountain. We would park our... Um, uh, in this particular instance, there's like literally two yurts, and then we were one of ten people here. Um, outside by the door on the other side, uh, we would just set up the tripods, and we'd go in and, and get a little bit more. The other nice thing about this particular year, you'll see in this, in this picture, it's, it's all lit up, but um, he has windows. So when, when we stayed with him, you could conceivably not even go outside. If you just wanted to do this and not shoot it, but you wanted to have the experience of it, you could actually sit in here and enjoy the show. Tabachina Hot Springs, those yurts are all heavy, thick canvas. You can't see through them. So you have to, either going to sit there for four hours and go and peek outside, um, but to, you're, to see it, you're going to have to go outside and experience it. The lodge, obviously, you can get in and out of the lodge as often as you want, and you're in the middle of nowhere, so you leave the camera here out there, too. Yeah, so picking your viewing place is, is really key. This is the historic lodge at Bettles. Um, this is the same place that has a lake that I mentioned that you could go and see it. But they'll drive you to the lake. You don't have to walk there. They'll drive you. There's a warming hut there. So again, you can get in and hide. This is the, in this whole part of the lodge down here is like a whole clothing factory for you to get all the things you need if you need to bring it. 
The challenge about staying over by the lodge, not so much that the lodge gives off light, I mean, in this photo, I'm facing that way, but um, there's a weather station in Bettles, and it had, and an airport. Bettles, if you actually look it up, it's called Bettles Airport. The whole town and the purpose of the town is an airport. Uh, for people who are stopping on their way to you know, fuel to and from the North Slope where they do all the oil. Um, so you have some lights that are never going to be out. And depending on which direction you're facing, um, there's also really, see, see here, you can see red, there's a red light for the, uh, for the airport to be there. How, if you have, you guys have all been lucky, but the people who haven't, you know, try to put yourself in an opportunity to do it. It's, it's breathtaking. Unfortunately, this isn't your summer weather, you know, shorts and whatnot. This is the 14 layers parka and heavy clothing event.